Uh, the views and opinions expressed on the Damned Podcast do not necessarily represent the official policy or positions of any agency or business. Now let's start the show. Don't be nervous. <laughs> just the world forever. Exactly. Yeah. Just, <laughs> we could say hi to my son in the future. Um, <laughs> hey guys, welcome to the Bomb Podcast. I am your host, David MD. If you're not familiar with the podcast, we talk to local talent for uh, pretty much in driving distance of my home. <laughs> Uh, about bombing at life, bombing at love, and bombing on stage. With me today for the first time on the bomb, this is your second appearance though yes. at Studio MD. Yes, indeed. John Joe Bear, what's thank going you, on, you, buddy? You. Is it John or Jonathan? Jonathan. I never, Jonathan. I'm the fool. I want to really bother people with my <laughs> name. Like, you have to say it all for me to pay attention. And the thing is, you're from Louisiana too, so not right. only do I have to be bothered with the Jonathan, right? I got to figure out how you want right. you and a uh, and fucking Ledger. See, like Laguerre, yeah. Laguerre, yeah. Laguerre. I yeah. keep fucking up his name, man. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. That's the way Louisiana is. It's the only place. It's like Robado is Roba Ducks. You're like, that's a whole lot of X's for an O. I it's could French, never bro. go down there. Between y'all's accents and the way you guys want to interpret like the uh, English language. Hey man, it's uh first, we don't really interpret language at all. I'm <laughs> 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 No, no, that's uh that's that's the places where Lege is from. We are like we have the French <laughs> we have the French roots. So So you guys drink your uh your Coors Light with your pinkies up, huh? Yeah, man. We try to be hoity toity about the champagne of beer. <laughs> champagne. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, before we got started, I sat down with uh, Jonathan and uh, figured out some of his bombs here. So I'm just going to start throwing these bombs over the plexiglass here and let you blow them up over there. I'm so. okay discussing my failure. There's a lot. <laughs> You're in the right place to talk <laughs> failure. <laughs> Although I am proud of myself. We did that on the first take there. So there uh, I'm already not bombing the bomb. Damn. Let's talk about this breakup. Now. Yeah. Oh, which one? Okay. Oh, the one with the wife, huh? One with the wife. Yeah. So was apparently, the, you guys were dating uh, back in school. <laughs> dating and then, in high school. There you go. And then, uh, you know, short story is we broke up for ten years, and I hated her guts. And she what was, was it you hated about her? Or should uh, I dig into that while you guys are married? <laughs> no, it's fine. Like the thing that this was this is the joke, but it is true. Like we knew everything we didn't like ab- about each other when we were getting back together, so it was no surprises. You didn't have to wait down the line to discover. It's like, oh, I already know <laughs> what you're doing. Oh, God damn it. You know? Um, but it was one of those things, I guess, to be quite honest, I just wasn't ready. And I don't think she was either, but me more than her for sure, to be in a long term serious relationship because it was a very passionate and intense relationship. And we were teenagers. Okay. And um, she was going to college and then I was going to go to college right after that. And it was just one of those things, man. Like we we would argue, but we would both be very passionate about stuff. Um, and she's super smart and I'm super smart. And so we just go at it, man. And because we're passionate about it, it gets like nasty. And when you're young, it's immature. And (laughs) that's the thing man. you really don't have any inhibitions yet. You just like, Oh, I'm going to go straight fire. I didn't say you were bitch. (laughs) I said you acted like a bitch, bitch. You know? And then it's like, what? (laughs) Yeah, and you know that that's not really a justification. You're just mm. trying to like go the other person because you... I did hate my younger relationships when you kind of to- talked out of spite. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, I mean, that still toxic. happens. I don't know if it's in the same way as just spite. I think a lot of times, like most marriages, I th- I think will have their arguments, especially if they're passionate people that care about where the direction. If they have a family, mm. like the direction life is supposed to go, that's a big deal. So if you're just blasé about it, that's not really good either. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to have hatred. Like there are many times during conversations where you have to remind one another, like, no, 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 no. You married me because you trust that I'm going to think these things through and that I'm not incompetent and that we're trying to do what we feel is best in our, everyone's interest. Mm-hmm. You know, and the good thing is, as I got older, I realized there are core values that matter, even if the hobbies are different. Okay. Uh, the, and I think a lot more people get into relationships with hobbies and not with the core values that are important to them in life. And then they wake up one day and they're like, oh, how did I get here? And now there's a lot of other options. So, yeah, <laughs> that was one of the uh, cornerstones that uh, my wife and I are still on is, um, you know, she she was a little more interested in starting the family, like having a kid and everything. My it was always like on the table. It's like, OK, as long as I can chase my comedy aspirations, mm-hmm. we can try to. 
you know, keep going or they feel like that. Well, so. and, and that's an important thing too. Like, um, there's this wonderful man and well, this couple actually, Jimmy and Sue Ford, and they're, um, like punk rock musicians and really good producers, both great songwriters. And Jeremy and I were talking about how we were concerned because we, you know, what's going to happen to our careers as musicians and artists when we have kids. And they both were like, what are you talking about? That's who you are. You take your kids with you. That's your life. You don't have kids to not show them who you are. Yeah. And, and the great part is they're still very responsible, artistic people. And that was one of those things that was like, oh, you can do both. Like there are lots of people who do that. And I think there's this misnomer because there's the, the showmanship of the entertainment industry Mm -hmm. and the partying aspect. But those people still get up and show up to their meetings with their producers. They still get up and they show up to sign the contracts. They still meet with their lawyers. They still plan the tours. They still do all the other things outside of the fuckery that they allow you to see. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because they want you to believe that they're larger than life. Yeah. Right. And um, so that was really eye opening. And and that breakup was was brutal, you know, and it was funny because during that time as the as the heat would start to cool off. We'd see each other, and and I did my best to not acknowledge that. But she would say, "Oh yeah, well, I, you know, I still had feelings for you from time to time." But we were, she was with someone else, or I was with someone else, and it was always like intentionally pushing it aside, okay. as opposed to just, "Oh, it's you." You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you can have breakups and be friends with people, and it's you've gone your own way, and there's no passion there. It's just, "Oh, you're my great friend, and we had this thing a long time ago." And then there's like, "Oh, I know you." <laughs> for better and worse right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah up. so let's see uh, a brutal part of that breakup also was like I straight up like drove across the country from like southern Louisiana to a little town called Linden Washington okay oh so you went uh, northwest oh yeah okay. as far as you could possibly <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it was weird because I had a lot of uh, people that I love but I also had a lot of enemies they actually threw a I hate Jonathan party I found out later which was ironic because they were all like fuck Jonathan and then I had to come back home and they all knew that I knew they did that <laughs> and they all knew that I knew they needed shit for me from time to time oh and shit so I was like ha huh. yeah maybe you should think a little bit <laughs> did you let him have the opportunity to apologize or you just completely <laughs> said fuck off uh, it depends on who it was. Okay. You know, for real. I mean, that's what relationships are. I mean, I certainly like I was not a perfect person at that time, mm-hmm. but there are instances where like, you know, I've had, fr- I had friends that I would go out on my way to do things for, and then suddenly it was like, oh, well, fuck that guy. I was like, well, bitch, I fucking got off of work every morning and drove your ass to school because your parents were alcoholics. You know, I wasn't in school anymore. Maybe you should be a little thankful, asshole. Better recognize. Right. Recognize, <laughs> yeah. <Carlos> fuck. <laughs> you know? Fucking A, man. Um, any traffic tickets driving up to Washington? Or is this, uh, no, uh... not to Washington, bro. Okay. No, that, that the worst uh, ticket was uh, because I had this chick in the car with me and like we were, you know, it was one of those nice dates and we were goofing off and we'd stop at a stoplight and we'd kiss and then we'd drive a little further and we, you know, and then I stopped. You're so much more passionate than me. I'm like, hey, I'm driving. Fucking (laughs) sit down and shut up. I was stopped (laughs) and I stopped and then I went to go on and a cop pulled me over and the worst one was because I paused. I didn't stop. Now I didn't roll through Paul, I stopped. I just didn't stop stop long enough to his uh, liking. See, anytime I see a cop around there, I count to three at a complete stop, see, and that's I, where. That's probably I'm going to steal that from you <laughs> from now. On. One Mississippi, right, two Mississippi. Just like, it's long enough, and this is annoying. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you weren't like me and fucking blew a, a red light because you're too fucking annoyed. With it cycling three no, times. with a cop behind you, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a fucking genius. Um, man, that fucking sucks. Yeah, but I haven't had any uh, traffic incidences in a long time. I was 34 years old when I finally started collecting points on my driver's license. I think that's a good run. Yeah. You know, a lot of people collect that shit in their we, 20s. We didn't have points, so I don't know. Okay, I think it's 20. No. I think it's 12 in Colorado. Oh, okay. and then they start taking legal action oh, of dear. your accumulated... I don't know yeah, if you fucking lose your license or whatever, guess, but let's see. Another ticket was, I mean, it wasn't the worst, but I definitely had the most cops with guns on me during it. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> what prompted that? <laughs> All right, so I was uh, up really late and I was visiting someone and I was driving back from North Louisiana and it's just a road of nothing, you know, for like 
80 miles. So I'm just 75 miles an hour blasting the misfits. And then uh, I look behind me and there's like five or six cars, like cop cars and they're hauling ass. And I'm like, Oh man, they're after somebody. I literally <laughs> fucking think this I'm like, man. They're after somebody and I'm just going and I'm waiting for them to drive past me and they don't. <laughs> Isn't that the worst like, feeling? Yeah, like, I'm going to pull over? Like, yeah. ah, fuck, they followed me over. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, shit, they're after me. And, bro, like, I pulled over, and the first thing, like, I got out of the car, and I was like, I'm so sorry. And all of them just like, yeah. Yeah, dude, and they just started pulling. And I had my hands up, and I was like, oh, my God. And then the coolest part was I didn't get shot. The second, <laughs> yeah. Usually the, the coolest part of a police right, stop is not being shot. And the second coolest part was the cop was like, man, if you would have pulled over three miles down the road, so I have no idea how long they were chasing me. It's like, if you would have pulled over three miles down the road, I probably would have let you go. If it would have been just, you know, if I found out it was just cause you were listening to music to stay awake. Right. And he's like, but I've got, you know, I think it was like five or six of them. And it was like their County. And then the one, Oh shit. You're crossing jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck. So that was the, He's got drugs. And that was a huge <laughs> ticket, by the way. Like that one cost a couple months of work. Yeah. Uh, but, and I had to go back there. I was supposed to go back there, but I worked that out to where I didn't have to go because I was in school. and that was nice. So you had multiple cop cars behind you yeah. and you jumped out of the car. I was exhausted and listening to the misfits. So, But like you didn't wait for the cop to approach you. You oh, jump no. out. Of, you, you are so fucking my, lucky you survived. Hands up. Well, they weren't all out of their car yet. You okay. Know, like I, I pulled out first and then got out and then they were like and jumping out and, fucking Fuck. pulling out guns and stepping out behind the door. So it was had I pulled over and they pulled over at the same time, I probably would have thought a little differently, but I was just like, show them you don't have a gun <laughs> <laughs> in sw uh, right. fast, fast jerking fast motions. Right. Let me show them. Yeah. I don't have a gun. Yeah. So lucky to fucking die. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, several times, bro. Several times. <laughs> but uh, your your first traffic ticket that you mentioned yeah, uh, no, sounded bro. rather sexy. It it sounds that way until you realize that it was going to be like three hundred dollars, and the cop was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hate man. You know, dude. And like I told you, I was I had super long hair at the time, and uh, I had a Danzig sticker on the back of my truck, and this is Southern Louisiana. So of course it's. You're a fucking drug addict. Yep. I mean, the dude's like shining the light straight in my eyeballs. He's like, why are you squinting? And I was like, dude, you're just <laughs> the thousand watt want, fucking yeah. light bulb. Right, because my you eye. use this to look through the swamp to catch people. I think so. Bray's looking through your fucking like right. engine block yeah, <laughs> through my eyes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so like I was saying, it was a sexy uh, uh, traffic incident, mm -hmm. which uh, transitions us into mm -hmm. the worst sex story, a bomb of a sex story. Oh yeah, bro. That was gonna be the um, the side effects of Effexor ruining teenage love. You know, <laughs> Effexor. You said as an anti antidepressant. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, either, either that was gonna be Effexor or maybe Zoloft at the time, because mm -hmm. they tried me on the barrage of them when I was young, and uh, so that one made me just like really, really difficult to perform, and then just bust too early, bro. Mm. I mean, like you just ruined like with. You know, my super beautiful wife and I, I saw her story for her was like, I saw her on a school bus for like on a field trip and she was in a grade above me and I was too nervous to talk to her for like a year. So I didn't even talk to her. And then someone uh, borrowed a cigarette from her and I was like, that's my end. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I have cancer too. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, was like I've got, I don't have, I ain't got looks, but I got personality. Let's make this happen. <laughs> Yeah, and she'll tell people too. Like the reason she hooked up with me is because I could make her laugh. Okay, and uh, and yeah, so that was. Uh, so it wasn't being in bed. It was. Uh, uh, it wasn't at that time. <laughs> it wasn't at that time. But you know, she's patient. She holds out. And so you're saying it was difficult to perform. Yeah, oh yeah. But then you immediately like shoot your shot. Yeah, bro, it sucks. Fuck. Yeah. So like you you gotta. So if you really put depressed, some effort into it, you're going to be depressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like that's I thought it was a pretty good day, so I uh, pulled it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fucking antidepressants are meant to kill you anyway. That is a definite uh, long conversation we could have. Um, sure. So you're trying to build up steam right. sexually, but yeah. like when you get to where you need to be, you immediately yeah, it's like hey, fuck, be man. done. <laughs> wow. Right. You got other stuff to feel robotic about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, at least you didn't shoot up a school. So. <laughs> Yet. No. <I'm> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> just a joke. Although I did it? wear a trench coat before it was cool. <laughs> I think in Southern Louisiana. Have which I is seen stupid. you in a trench coat yet? Uh, I feel like I've seen you yeah, on yeah. <laughs> trench coat coat mafia. I was so excited that I moved somewhere where wearing a coat makes sense. <laughs> because back there, sweet, I don't have to have heat stroke going to this open mic. Me, bro. <laughs> like, I straight up, I was the trench coat kid, dude. And from you know until now, actually. So I was the trench coat guy. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah, like 108 degrees, just sweating profusely. Ooh. Yeah, doesn't leather catch a smell too when it has too much? Well, sweat I didn't in have. It? I couldn't afford the leather one okay. at that time, so it was just a standard black trench coat because I'm dumb and nothing says goth like 108 degree <laughs> with 4,000. Was shade. your mascara running too? I, like? didn't wear, I didn't do that. I didn't go that far. I didn't do the paint. I didn't paint my face. I didn't get tattoos. I wasn't that cool. Do you have any tattoos now? No. No? No. And the reason is because um, the way civilizations work, some things I like might become illegal one day, and I'd rather them just go, the white guy did it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This thing, too, it's an identifier. Right. Exactly. It's a crime. Yeah, it's an identifier. (laughs) Like the guy with the Danzig tattoo. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Um, It sounds like a lot of... um, your stories and everything kind of clash with like the conservatism of the state you grew up in. Oh, rock. Um, which is funny because your short story um, deals with basically the Sodom and Gomorrah of uh, the South, Mardi yeah, Gras. <laughs> so that's let's a, get into that. Well, that's, that's one of the best <laughs> things I love about the rebellious nature of Louisiana, folks. It's like uh, we'll take care of ourselves. Even when we don't want to, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like you can't make me as drunk as I can make me. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm giving up Lent. Oh, sure, we'll have Lent the day before. We'll get super fucked up, dude. <laughs> I, every comedian I listen to on the big podcast, they they say, uh, "What part? What city is that in?" I should know this shit. Mardi Gras. Well, um, there's, it's the whole state, but New Orleans. Then there's Mamou or Mamou and Lautel, which are the those are the small town authentic ones where like. Okay. You go house to house and you, everybody gives you food and then you chase a chicken in a crazy outfit. The fuck? Yeah, that's that's the real one, right? And okay. At the end of the day, you make a giant jambalaya and a gumbo. Okay. And then there's the New Orleans ones and the bigger city ones, which is like uh, all the crews with the floats. And What's the, the big one? Uh, it's in the French Quarter. And, uh, um, can't think. Oh, uh, Bourbon Street. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of. I've them. heard disgusting things about Bourbon yeah, Street. Yeah, disgusting. Bur- Bourbon Street. Let me see how to say this in the <laughs> nicest, most honest way possible. Hey, Bourbon, nice and honest don't yeah, go together sometimes. Right, yeah. <laughs> Bourbon Street has probably the most character I've ever seen in any place I've ever gone in the world. And people like to pee on it. <laughs> so it's like that. You it know? seems like just like an open like piss trench like is by the sounds it of it. It depends. On, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough, especially when you get like a million or two million people there. Like, cause there's the new, the new Orleans Mardi Gras is brutal. Like if you want to experience it, I, th- I say, go experience it, but no, don't fall for the, um, touristy bullshit, not just the touristy bullshit. Don't fall for the, the belief that you can just flash anybody and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> cause that's a lot of people think that. Fuck. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're like getting arrested and like, I thought it was fine to show my dick in public. <laughs> and everyone's like, why would you ever think that? You know? Didn't the Girls Gone Wild guy have to flee the country because of like half the shit he recorded uh, at Mardi Gras? F- filthy sex offender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Piece of shit. Right. Well, Jokes. so <laughs> this Mardi Gras shark story, did this happen in the French this Quarter down a small there? town or? Mardi Gras. Okay. Yeah. So this happened at a great Mardi Gras because... Um, it it was like four miles like miles long Jesus. like of the floats it was that long and it went through like they blocked off um this small road that was like the link between two cities but the interstate was open but that back road like you're just that was the day okay and they would roll down and like they would pass beer off the floats because you could just walk up to it with our food like it was just hell it was just yeah. a party bro was, and that's my favorite is the small town mardi gras because those are like the awesome parties and the floats are just some of them are dope some of them are jacked up but you're like yeah we did it you know? <laughs> it's awesome and i uh, drank way too much and it was jaeger induced oh. and uh, yeah which um i hate 
black licorice. So I don't even know why I did that. I just think that I was. Uh, That's the weird thing is how is Jaeger like one of the most popular drinks out there? Yeah. Yet black licorice is like because because you have kryptonite. to get drunk to keep drinking. That's <laughs> that is true. It's pretty much the more drunk you get, the least you give a shit about, it, or right, the less right. you give and a it, shit. And it works fast. So that's a it's a. I What's look the it, proof on that motherfucker? I don't look it up, dude. But I think it's it's like the Everclear <laughs> level of stuff, and I don't mean it in like it's good I mean, at all. I mean that it's like you could buy a shot or two of that for the night if you're not a heavy drinker. Damn, it's that strong. Thirty five percent by volume. Yeah. So you drink a couple of those, you're yeah. good. It wasn't hard, right? <laughs> and and so you don't have to spend a whole shit ton of money. Fuck. Now Everclear, that's what I used to do. I have never fucked with Everclear. What it, what type of alcohol is that? It's like a grain alcohol, and it's okay. just it's basically drinking suffering. <laughs> yeah. And, but it was like I would go into a bar because I, I wasn't a big drinker, but a lot of my friends were. We do shows and stuff, and uh, like after a show, they'd want to drink. And they'd buy beer and flavorful stuff. And I'd go up and it was like a dollar or two for Everclear. And I'd do like a shot and I'm just like hammered for an hour. Jesus and then Christ. if I did two, I was like fucking. I was talking to uh, George on the bomb. To, and yeah. uh, he said he used to mix that with um, like healthy like shakes. Like, you know, the naked yeah. uh, bottle shakes or whatever the fuck yeah. that is. Like, I would just be so worried about the pulp and like. Yeah, bro, yeah. that sounds like you're ruining a shake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to put fucking I mean, it's, nuclear it's waste in this It's certainly going to make it better. <laughs> like, it's certainly going to make the Everclear better, but it's going to ruin your flavor. What does that shit taste? Like, is it a vodka kind of uh, burn to it? Is yes, it... but worse. Fuck. But worse. Like, imagine the cheapest vodka sitting in the sun, and then you <laughs> drink it. <laughs> and it, that's Everclear. <laughs> So it's liquid regret is what yes. it is. Fucking yes. A, man. Um, worst day of school. Uh, whenever uh, in middle school, I used to sling now and leaders. And, uh, and the. I hate now. Those are the pink and white ones, right? Well, no, bro. That's Starburst, bro. Now and leaders is like got all the different flavors, bro. Grape and apple. Green apples was the high seller, though. Green apple and cherry. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, look, yeah. See? Oh, right. Right. what am I thinking of? That's what I would get to. Look, go back, go back that jar. All right. So when I was younger, right, my mom had a Sam's Club membership. Okay. And I got an allowance. Good and plenty. So that's yeah. what I was thinking of. Okay, continue. So so I got this <laughs> allowance, and it was from this allowance was any extracurricular stuff I had to do, I had to pay for. She wanted to send, show me how to use money. So if I wanted to get my hair cut more than once a month, paid for it. Wanted to go to the movies, paid for it. Wanted mm-hmm. anything that wasn't school supplies, paid for it. So I went and I took my allowance and I just bought like three of those things <laughs> and I sold them for like a quarter a piece or four for a dollar, right? And it's 150 count. So Fuck. I'd make, at the time, they were yes. like eight bucks or something. Yeah. So eight buck investment i'd make like forty dollars and i'd just be balling as fuck so i would like i'd be able to pay for my own phone i had my own phone line in my room jesus I was a kid, dude right? it was like eighteen dollars <laughs> and like other kids were like what the fuck are you rich and i was like no bro i'm slinging now later like a 13 year old scarface right, like, yeah. you got your and own then, fucking phone and shit <laughs> like 12 because this is the kicker i was 12 years old because mr potan came out and he said, uh, I'll never forget it. He goes, uh, Mr. Jobe, I appreciate your entrepreneurial spirit, but we have gotten calls from the parents and you can no longer be selling these now and because they are spending their money, their <laughs> lunch money on this candy. And I said, but it doesn't say I can't in the rule book. <laughs> <laughs> so I came back next summer, like after the summer break. And he caught me off the bus, and he goes, Mr. Jobert, did you take a look at the handbook? <laughs> and I was like, oh, you mother... So, like, I shouldn't have said anything, right? Uh, so they changed it. You couldn't sell any outside food. So I started making little shitty leather bead crosses, and I sold those for $5. <laughs> so kids now are not eating the whole week. And that was... Uh, my parents... That was me. <laughs> I think that was one of the failings of my parents was they didn't really show me, like, how to like work and like make money and shit yeah, yeah. because like i hear your story about that i hear uh delgado apparently delgado's kid he used to go into the fucking teacher's lounge <laughs> yeah pull the fucking sodas and sell those yeah brilliant <laughs> uh, i'm hoping as much as i want to be a responsible parent I, i'd still want to have a hustler for a kid 
Yeah, I, I might mean, be teaching my kid how to do that. It was certainly ethically <laughs> questionable, but it wasn't illegal. You know what I mean? And so that's well, that's where they put the little bullshit like uh, not marked for individual retail. Yeah, and, you know, that, well, whatever. <laughs> that's I bought it. Awesome, Once I bought dude. it, you can't tell me what to do with it. Exactly. Yeah. It's America. Right. <laughs> I I'm didn't so say I jealous. made them. <laughs> I didn't say I created these in my lab. I'm just vending. Like, yeah. right. just consider me the machine, bro. I'm so jealous of guys that hustle like that. Um, when was your your story about being hit in the balls? Is that in school or is that? Or no, you said it was because your kids. Oh yeah, the so last we love the school connection the there. Yeah, yeah. Last time I got hit in the balls, I don't know when it was, but I know it was one of my children. And it could have been crawling over me and hitting me with their knee or jumping on the bed when they're not supposed to. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think I met your kids uh, when we had that one kickball thing yeah. last summer. Um, yeah. How old are they? Uh, well, six and nine was when you met them then. Now okay. it's, it's seven and ten. Okay. Ten. So they're not a kamikaze headbutt level anymore. Not yet. No. That's, I'm That's terrified. Bro. Yeah. That's when you, you <laughs> hold them like that. Yeah. No way, because they will get, dude. I got headbutt in the nose. Fuck, it's it's coming. I mean, just accept it. <laughs> I'm uh, so Max is now two months old ish. I'm the first fear of being kicked in the balls is yeah. when they get to that torso size, where like you know, yeah, they well, you look them in the eyes, but they're able to kick it, you in the balls. Yeah, but it'll be like a um, it'd be like a graze. It'll still hurt. <laughs> it'll have an aftershock, but it's when they're. Kid kids. That's just, Maybe that's uh, evolution kind of like roughing up your balls a little bit to like get them ready for like right. kamikaze headbutt. Yeah, like. well, that's a, that's that's the baby's <laughs> internal jealousy that they, they won't know others. So they're like just trying, to crush, <laughs> trying to crush your reproductive. Hey, at this point, I think I'll let them. <laughs> My wife and I are uh, going to have that conversation event. She wants to have two kids. It's a good thing to do, bro. I got to replace uh, yourself. Shut up. <laughs> shut up, Jonathan. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying, bro. Her thing is uh, when traveling, um, they'll be able to talk to each other. I was like, yeah. how much traveling are we doing? Well, that's going to be a, a, a considerable yeah, concern. It's like I did it where uh, like I kept telling my daughter, this is going to be your best friend. You know, like this is the one person. But what if it turns out they hate each other? Well, that's their fault. <laughs> I mean, I'm giving you the tools to like each other. You're being raised in the same place. You better figure it out because at the end of the day, these will be the people that will have your back first before anybody else that steps in, you know? Yeah, I never I mean, had that. Being an only child in the military. Yeah. Like, yeah, moving every three years. Oh, it's weird for me with family, too, because my family was super small. Yeah, you're an only child, too. Right? Uh, well, no, I had a brother, but he was eight years older. Okay. So it's not like we hung out or did any brotherly stuff or anything like that. And then I had no cousins or any extended family. Okay. And uh, so, you know, I didn't get any of that either. But I saw some of my friends that really, even the dysfunctional ones, like they had a love for their sibling, even through the dysfunction. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have that with functional kids? I bet you I could make that happen. And I'm going to do my best to... Not in a broken home right. kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not destroy your Let's see what this looks like in a healthy happens. relationship. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. All right. Fucking A, man. Uh, crop dusted. Crop dusted, bro. Probably, I don't know, like a week ago. Like I said, I don't even think about it. You know, you just got to let it go, bro. You let it go. I might be nice if there's a crowd and walk away to the one who's the least interesting. <laughs> <laughs> just try to get them to right. go Leave away. it to them and blame it on them. <laughs> Just walk around in the circle and socially like, ostracize right. them. Through. Yeah. You're the boring one. We got to get rid of you. What was your uh, food of choice for um, for 2020? Trying to get through the pandemic. This is gonna tie into that crop dust thing. Oh, bro! Uh, f- stuff we stocked up on was. Um, oh, so you guys? Oh, yeah, because you're a family of four. Yeah, but you have had, to stay in the house. Yeah, and we had um, at the time we had seven total in there jesus and we got quarantined three times okay and yeah so you gotta think about two weeks at a time so that's six weeks of complete thing isolation and then when this all happened uh, i couldn't get in touch with my doctor and our uh, the internet system wasn't working Mm -hmm. it kept booting me out and i had to wait like two months before i could get a meeting and so i had no idea whether i was in the high risk or not fuck because you know Dum dums would just rather see their face on TV and say <laughs> what we know. Yeah. 
And I don't know about you, but that didn't help me. If you're high risk, I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? <laughs> like, I do a lot of I don't things. skateboard. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't even <laughs> own a motorcycle. <laughs> You know, so uh, but you guys are responsible adults. It sounds yeah. like you you brought the but food I home. home. Yeah, I stayed okay. home for like the first two months, and then like Jeremy would go out. Okay, um, to do the the brief shopping or the um, pickups. Okay, so you guys' diet didn't really change. For me, it was Taco Bell. Yeah, uh, which turned into a lot of crop dusting. Right, yeah. That was the the that arc dude. I was trying to make. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I found out it was fun. two uh, chicken quesadillas. That will that fuck up my stomach if I have just one. No crop dusting. Two, I don't know if that's yeah. sauce or whatever, but right. <laughs> Indian Indian food will do that. Uh, a lot of, lot of I really haven't fucked with curry Indian or, food. or beans. Like we did a lot of uh, beans oh for the good. Taco Bell menu or well no just, for just like, we didn't do a lot of fast food. We cooked oh, you guys, yeah, and so we had a lot of black beans and uh, you know that. Uh, your some. wife does come off kind of vegan, where she would no way no. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is like Rambo and dead animals. <laughs> That's why we get a log so well. <laughs> Just murking anything with a pulse, huh? Bro. <laughs> if it's tasty. <laughs> if it's tasty. Nice. Um, So I have written down, there's a separate story for drunkest you've ever been. I want to say this was a hallucinogenic That was, uh, uh, yeah, in alcohol. New Orleans. Okay. Uh, they have the chartreuse, which is the sister drink to absinthe. How do you spell that? Because uh, I've never heard of this shit. C H R T R C H R T R U E S E. All right, I, I need a syllable C-H- or a vowel. Yeah. C H A A R T T. There you go. Sorry, through. Never heard of this shit. Yeah, it doesn't taste very good, but it works. It works. It works. Okay. Um, and so it's very similar to absinthe and that was when I had the golden ring. So that was the the story where I, we went to this bar and the intent, like I, I didn't drink very often, but there'd be three days a year where it's like, I'm getting drunk. Gonna blow the walls out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing in excess, even balance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, dr- I, I drank, I don't know, a, a bunch of white Russians. It was the first time I ever had a white Russian. So have that yet was to good. have one. So it was really good. Okay. And then, um, and then I had like seven of those and I went to the bathroom and, you know, I just peed and I felt great. I was like, it's no big deal. And then I opened the door and the whole world just like became engulfed in a circular gold light, but I could only see everything within the circle. So if I looked around, I could see this way, but everything, if I was looking at you, this didn't So you're looking exist. through like a toilet paper too. Yeah. Like, yes. Fuck. Yes. Except with gold. <laughs> Well, at least it looked classic. <laughs> yeah, and so it hit me really hard, and then uh, I went outside. I don't even remember when. I mean, I was with a group of people, so we were hanging out. And then uh, I began to uh, just sit on the curb and put my head between my legs and throw up. <laughs> and then a cab pulled up, and I was like, can you take us to our hotel? It's right down the street. I just can't walk. It's like four blocks, please. And he was like, no. <laughs> and so I began to berate him. And I told him that, uh, you know, not like a, like you're a piece of shit. It was more of like berating his lack of empathy. And I just, I said, you know, look, dude, I'm just a human man. I'm just trying to get right down the road. I'll pay extra. I'll hang my head out your window. I swear to you, bro. And he's like, no. And I said, I said, uh, if you don't take me there and something happens to me tonight, I want you to remember my voice. And then I asked you for help and you said, no. The philosophical drunk. Right. <laughs> and then the he curb. looked at me and he's like, get in, hang your head out the window. <laughs> and so I did. And I got back to the hotel with uh, a few other people. And it was and like the person that I was with, he was like, I was amazed. I have no idea how that happened to you or how you convinced a cabbie in New Orleans. Seriously. To, like, to give you a ride. If I was a, a taxi driver in New Orleans, yeah. as soon as I heard the alcohol in your voice, that slurring everything. Yeah. you wouldn't have been able to get, get my attention the second time. Oh, yeah, time. it was a whole bunch of us, too. What the fuck, man? But, you know, like I... You got a saint for a taxi driver. Hey, yeah. <laughs> and I'm convincing sometimes. Sometimes I can really ham it up. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying both of you, uh, you and your wife, are the intellectual type and everything. So I'd yeah. imagine your fucking rabbit holes in conversation just go forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it depends, too. And it's hard, too, because there, there are many things we disagree with, and then the... Th- and then there's a lot that we agree with and then we debate the middle like we talk in the in between 
Okay. And, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's, I, I don't know. Like I, I have this thing and it, and it's wonderful with her too, where I can't be friends with people that'll get offended by an idea because I need to discuss every possible idea in case I'm wrong. Yeah. Right. Like I, even the atrocious ones, why is that atrocious? And the reason I always look at it as like that is because the, the vast majority of human behavior is not instinctual. It's learned behavior. Mm -hmm. And so are there things that we are, for lack of better word, programmed to believe or do we really feel that way back? Because especially emotionals are, are emotional responses are typically conditioned responses, right? Based off of, and, uh, um, like some kind of biological driving force. Mm. And so I just need to test all that. That's the, I hate people. They're like, Oh, I'm offended. I'm going to completely shut down this conversation yeah. is like, well, then you're never going to learn anything outside of your circle. Yeah. Like there's things that I hear, you know, politically fuck. I mean, every other yeah, day everybody. I got something I fucking hate, <laughs> but like, I'm at least going to listen to the other side there and figure out, should I adjust my, my thinking right. or should I be cognizant? Cause just cause you're offended by something doesn't mean you need to completely shut it out. It should be known in your, your atmosphere. Okay. That, that idea is flowing out. Cause the more you're, you're familiar with that, the less you're going to be butthurt about it. Well, that, and you, know? and you have to be prepared to react to the other people's ideas in a way that, and in a way that can maintain civilization. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just the reality. Like, I think we're uncivilizing ourselves. We, we, are, like, we, are, yeah. we are. We are. Tribalism. It was civilization by choice. You know, like it's a it's a conscious decision, and and a lot of people forget that. And you know, like I'll I'll have the hard conversations, and if I believe I'm right, of course I'm gonna hold on to that. And if you can prove me wrong, cool. I'll probably be mad about it for a little while. That's the in inherent nature of our ego. Right. Like I just fuck off. Oh. And then I'll think about it like, oh, because I've changed my mind about a, a lot of shit. You know, mm -hmm. I've had a lot of opinions that have wavered through time based on new information or new thought processes or where one thought contradicted with another thing. So I couldn't do anything with it. You know, it's hard to hold both <laughs> circle and not circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm laughing because uh, we're getting that's probably the deepest this, right. this podcast right. has right. been. Sorry. Sorry. And the next question is Perfect. itchy ass asshole. <laughs> it just has a was that? We looked it up. The pillowdiddle sis, bro. Pillow pillowdiddle sis. All right, let's fucking paradiddle sis. It's not paradiddle, bro. Nobody was drumming my ass. All right, parad. How you spell P it? Pillow diddle, I think. Pillow. pillow. pillow you saw that? What Peebers brought P -I -L -O -D -I. up there? P i l o d i. P i l l o d i. D -I. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. Palanidal. That's it. Palanidal cyst. I'm just going to say yeah. paradiddle. Yeah, bro. Right there. <laughs> right on your butt. Fuck. So what is that? Collection of like sweat eventually? Over time, yeah. It's just like that, you know? And uh, it's uh, being in the South, dude, it happens. I was like, what the fuck is wrong? Like when it, the bur first time it burst, I was in the bathtub and my bathtub filled with blood and I freaked Holy out. Holy shit. And I mean like horror movie blood, like fucking... <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, dude. Hey, ha, hey, yeah. Ha. And so I uh, got that remedied, but that certainly caused some itchy butt, bro. Uh, more than 200,000 cases a year. Yeah, bro. I was one of those 200,000. And then, like dude. I said, I moved away, and now I don't have that issue anymore. So you said that. this is common in the South with, like, the humidity and everything. Yeah, and humidity and walking, like, you, your skin rubs together, and fucking, it just hurts, dude. And sometimes it would burst, and then I did a couple um, surgeries. But as you can see, but... <laughs> where yeah. it is the difficulty is when they cut you or they cut it and drain it and then they cut you and they try to sew it it's in the crack of your ass <laughs> so you know you're walking all day it's not like you're just you know if i were a multi-millionaire i could just lay on my stomach <laughs> yeah. and have people feed me grapes but i had shit to do <laughs> so good luck yeah. fucking a dude yeah mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you said uh, coming up to Colorado, mm -hmm. drying. I love the Colorado humidity around here. I was telling you, um, you know, when I lived in New Jersey, pretty much anywhere but here. Yeah, if I saw it was thirty two degrees, I knew instantly it was gonna be a sweatshirt. I knew it was gonna be something more, uh, heavier than that. Yeah. Nowadays, like look thirty two, I'm like all right, let me let me have my sweatshirt in hand, mm -hmm. and Just I'd say about case. half and half. Yeah. I'll literally walk out, just throw that sweatshirt in my car, and be good to go. There's that times like, oh yeah, this, this is a true 32. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When that wind hits too, that's what I have to prepare for. Yeah, and that 
even in like to the 40s, the mid 40s, if that wind hits, you're like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, going from uh, your uh, asshole story, but not really asshole, uh, to worst kiss. <laughs> worst kiss was. Uh... Uh, I'm one of these transitions, man. Yeah, man. Love, love it. Nice segue. Um, when I was younger and we didn't have internet and stuff, there was some girl I was talking on the phone with a lot. And then um, I met her and I just was not attracted to her. And, uh, you know, and I wasn't mean about it because I was still a kid. I was like, you're fucking bulldog ugly. I don't know. You know, like that. I wasn't like that. But anyway, she grabbed me and just like stuck her tongue in my mouth and like, not any way romantically, not any pleasant way. It was just like, uh, <laughs> it was like one day I was talking and then there was just a cold fish in my mouth. Ah. And I was like, nope. Is this Somewhere. your me too moment? <laughs> yeah, bro. That's one of the many me too movements. <laughs> God. Yeah. But you said you guys didn't meet teeth. Like that's, that, yeah, that's usually the measure of the worst kiss. Yeah, we didn't teeth clack. That's nice. yeah. yeah. Everybody loves that sound. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you're wearing braces. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Were you a braces kid or was no. she a braces kid? Uh, I was not a braces kid. Okay. I don't see. I like I said, I didn't lose my virginity until I was twenty-one. Right. I wore braces eighth, ninth, and tenth grade, yeah. and <laughs> nobody was kissing me, right. so that wasn't an issue. Should have moved to Louisiana, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I really don't like my cousins that much. Right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um. Don't worry, your cousins like your cousins that much. <laughs> Um, going from your paradiddle sis to this escalator story. Right. Oh yeah, the escalator. Because I didn't pee myself that I can remember in any embarrassing way, but I did sit down on an escalator at the mall once on a Saturday. Fuck. And then just not paying attention, rode it all the way down, and they have the teeth where it goes under, and it caught my shorts and my ass cheeks, and just I kept going, and it just ripped it all the way up to the waistband. And I had to walk through the mall with bloody ass cheeks and in search of. So it was just grazing and just like hitting. Like, oh, yeah, bro. It okay. was painful. But yeah. it wasn't like pulling. Because like there's fucking horror stories. No, out no, there. no. I, I mean, it pulled. There's... Like my skin was cut. Ha! Like I was, sli- my, I was sliced. I was bleeding in my ass. Fuck. Not in my ass, but on, from my ass cheeks. And then the, you know, my mom was old school. So it was like, why'd you do that? <laughs> All right, well let's go. Uh, let's go look for some stuff. And so I'm walking through the store, crying, and she's just like, "Yeah, you did that." You know, like, <laughs> see, in 2020, that would have been like, "Ooh, I got a nice lawsuit coming." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ironically, which is funny because she was a teacher who became a lawyer, but she didn't want to. She should have <laughs> backdated that. Hey, yeah, look at that! Didn't have water in it. Yeah, Good the go. lawsuit would be like, "My child was in stupid," <laughs> and, I and you're going to pay for, for that. <laughs> right. Um. But this doesn't tie in to your embarrassing injury. I believe it was a collarbone you popped or something? There's two of them. Uh, so okay. one, he, one's way more embarrassing and better than ever. And I've only told it once because it was like working on a bit. But you'll appreciate it. Okay. So the first one is the easy one, which is like, you know, you're riding your bike. And I'm um, looking back to, you know, like, I'm faster than you. And I turn around and a guide wire from a telephone pole clips me and just knocks me off my bike and breaks my collarbone. Fuck. And the most embarrassing story was when I was 11 and going through puberty, I wanted to see if I had pubic hair yet. So I went outside and I had matches and I lit a match and I was looking. And so I had my pants down and the wind blew and the fire went right into the urethra. That's the Ah! piss hole. Yeah. And so that's probably the most embarrassing injury ever. And also the one that makes every man go, I don't want to imagine that. But so I never had a fear of herpes after that. Or, <laughs> or I got a real, oh, the burn is. Yeah, the burn. Look, I've got the real fire. My dick is fire, bro. Lucky you didn't cauterize that fucking thing. Oh, yeah, bro. I didn't even think about that. That would be fucked up, bro, if I sealed it shut. And then that would have been the reason why you doubled down on the antidepressants. Right. And then. Right. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Jesus. Fuck, man. Yeah, man. So don't make that mistake, children. Just be patient. It's coming. It's fine. You got this. What 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 uh, matches? Like what the fuck, man? I didn't have a flashlight. And I didn't want my mom to know. Did they not so vet them down there yet? Or like, well, I mean, I'm sure they did, but we were broke. We didn't have a bunch of batteries and flashlights. It was the '80s, bro. You don't just like use flashlights willy nilly in hurricane country. You're gonna need that for a, like. You didn't need think that. about it. Yeah. <laughs> so there'll be seven to twelve days with no power. Fuck. And that's why you're up here. Uh, What's yeah. the weather? What blizzards? Like, oh, uh, wah. 
Yeah. Like, I don't care. <laughs> you know what comes in my house? Not snow. <laughs> so I don't give a shit. Like, everybody's yeah. like, oh, how's that cold weather? It's like, not in my house. It's fucking great. Yeah, there's not three feet of uh, flood water yeah. in my fucking house. Hell, cyclone ain't ain't doing nothing. That was actually my first uh, week here. Um, was a bomb cyclone. Yeah. Was it your first week? Well, I got here in October, so that was that first season. Oh, yeah, you just got here too. Yeah, I forgot we about both that. got here right around the same. You, time. me, and Delgado, and all probably within two weeks yeah. of arriving. Yeah, there are a bunch of us. It's that's one thing I find very fascinating. Just you know, behaviorally or just even just there's this interesting group of people that are all finding each other that are actually not even from here. Yeah. So it's weird because, and, and it's through natural gravitation. That's what I find fascinating about it. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, yeah. man. Cause like, all right. So the three of us, uh, I think Justin's the same, uh, boat. He's yeah. been here less than five years. Yep. Like Brad's fiend. Brad's fiend. I don't think I met Johnny Brad's fiend. Fiend? Nah. You don't know Johnny Brad's fiend. Dude, I've done less than. That's true. That's true. Less than seven performances yeah. in the, the yeah, spring, like a, so. a lot of a, there's just a group of uh, everybody that just got here within like the same time, like yeah. within the same six months that were all in the comedy. It was just everything led them here. That, that is weird, though, that all you, me, and Delgado, yeah. like all literally, that was our first weekend here. I think we showed up a uh, Tuesday of that week, and then the bomb cyclone. I think it was over the weekend, wasn't it? Friday, Saturday. Yeah, something like that. Fucking crazy. I, know, I got some footage of it. That was cool. It was cool. <laughs> I was like, man, that's awesome. I'm gonna put this in my mailbox. Um, we actually, my wife wanted to drive, so we were in a hotel room. And really beautiful because it was 70 degrees the day before. Yeah. The next morning, the day of the blizzard hitting, it was still really nice. So um, I heard about this nice little park that had a really nice view of the mountain. I go up there and I was like, ooh, I hear this blizzard's coming. So let me go to the grocery store real quick. Um, I'm going to go pick up the wife. So as I'm going to drive, she's like, I don't want to spend this blizzard in this hotel room. So we've already been here for three or four days. Um, let's go um, to my friend's house i don't know where the friend's at so we started driving 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 she's up near the academy right we're like south like uh Cairo springs so the last 10 or 15 minutes of this drive up to her fa- like because you know the academy is like on like the mountain basically yeah. oh, yeah. uh we we almost hit two like major uh uh post office boxes and everything right. it fucking sucked but moving on um <laughs> So you're probably one of you and Delgado have probably have the cleanest memory, the clearest memory of the '90s because yeah. you weren't like you, you know, you were already what a teenager hitting the '90s. Yeah, I was twelve okay. in 1990. Okay, gotcha. So you're six years ahead of me. Yeah. 1980s, what it sounds like you're born? Yeah, okay. uh, it was 78. 78. Okay. Um. So what is your favorite moment uh, or favorite thing about that bomb ass decade, the '90s? In the nicest way possible, I'll say the <laughs> death of grunge. Because there were some great bands, but everybody started to copy and emulate it. And also, the beginning, to me, that was like the discovery of, for me, like the European and Norwegian metal. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Every like, time you mention something, it like springs up my thoughts of the first podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like those were the, that, that to me was like the coolest time too. And also, obviously, like the beginning of the internet was pretty cool because we went that's whenever like you could start pirating things before it was illegal right? <laughs> so that was pretty dope because I, and i didn't feel bad about it at the time because i got ripped off so much by buying a cd for twenty dollars for the one song that was on it yeah and you wouldn't allow me to listen to it first i was like <laughs> fuck out of here bro i didn't feel i didn't have bad a uh, sharing, sorry not stealing sharing music with friends across that's the world. how napster got away with it for a little that's bit right, huh? that's right <laughs> I um my comedy aspirations started in like oh three and that was I think that's past the uh Lime Wire years and everything. But I was like, you know what, if I ever wanted to sell a comedy C D I'd be yeah. pissed that it's put out like that. So yeah. I was still in high school and I was taking that artist uh stance. Like, yeah. no, nah, fuck you guys. Like that's where and, and now all these these people are not artists. Like, well, you don't even make money from the albums. You make it from ticket price. Like, I'm not selling out fucking stadiums if I can't right. get the fucking money from the albums. Well, like, then, but see, the good thing that I thought that came from that was the beginning of the end of the recording industry because <laughs> that was fucking. That, well, that's it. Like that was whenever I learned more about the business side. I was like, oh well, they're not getting paid anyway. They're getting like two points 
So you get a CD for $20 and they're getting 20 cents to split between all the members and management. Yeah. There was shiesty back in um, the 60s too. Um, I did a paper on Jimi Hendrix when I was in high school. And so um, you familiar with Band of Gypsies, the album? Did you know that the reason why that was created was Hendrix was like fucked up out of his mind in a uh, a bar yeah. and some asshole was like, hey, can you sign this real quick? And it was a fucking contract, I think through Warner. <laughs> so Hendrix, to get them off the fu- off their back, right. he's like, fuck it, we're just going to re- do a live recording. Turns out it's like one of the greatest guitar performances ever recorded on, <laughs> on fucking vinyl. Right. Uh, machine guns just fucking bonkers yeah um but yeah fuck the, like those guys yeah and um, that's the majority of what it is and even now it's still dirty i i think it's a little more balanced than it used to be for sure because I mean, you still have guys like spotify floating around it's like they're fucking business deals fuck those guys well yeah i mean i get screwed on residuals all the time yeah. i mean i get like a thousandth of a, a, a penny per spin on certain plays you know so like when i get a penny it's exciting because i know a thousand people listen to <laughs> that <Woo>! song <laughs> yeah but i mean you know the good the good thing is it's there forever and because i own it i don't have to worry about any other third party okay you know what like, was the other site you're recommending to me uh the last time we we're here um uh, uh, cd baby was one uh, I'm looking into other ones now, Bandcamp and all that. Because CD Baby, Bandcamp, that was one. Like CD Baby ended up shutting down their digital store. CD Baby sounds like uh, you remember the uh, back in the '90s. Yeah. They sent you all the CD options, and uh, you you make your five options, and they keep sending you oh, yeah. the new ones. Yeah, disc makers. Yeah, yeah, fuck those guys. <laughs> yeah, bro. I got into it with them. <laughs> Man. Yeah, they shut down their digital store, so that hurt. Like that put a hurting on okay. me and other people. So now I'm trying to look for other things. They can still do distribution, so my stuff's on Amazon and oh nice, um, iTunes and everywhere. What would I look for on Amazon? Uh, uh, Jason and the Krugers. Okay, and you'll see a bunch of okay albums and EPs. And that'll be at the bottom of the screen there. So nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. I love my post editing these days. Good stuff. Um. Well, you're saying the death of grunge. Don't you wish the fucking lead singer for Pearl Jam put a fucking shotgun in his mouth instead of Kurt Cobain? Bro. I fucking hated that guy. That song, Ledbetter, is like the best work of mumble. (laughs) It influenced (laughs) mumble rock. Mumble rock. He brought around mumble rap. It was his fault. (laughs) You know? The fuck is that? Well, that was name? one of the things that started to suck too, because I was a big fan of Danzig at the time, and then, uh, and it came from the '80s where everybody was doing all like the, ah, and I hated that. Dude. <laughs> I always thought that was like fucking annoying, bro. Um, so I wasn't a big fan of the glam stuff, really. And but all of a sudden, every singer from every band that was getting signed outside of Soundgarden was, yeah, eating concrete again. Yeah. And it was all that. <laughs> and then they stopped playing guitar solos and they just started sucking. And I, I was just like, what? I was noticing um, when I was starting to grow into like what my music interest was. Like if you look at the 60s and the 70s, um, the lyrics were bridges to the great you know, uh, guitar solos and everything. Right, right. Now these little fucking 12 note solos are the bridge to the shitty lyrics that, <laughs> and like, if you look at like, um, when it comes to like these deep lyrics and everything, like look yeah. at Queens credits right. or Led Zeppelin's credits for the lyrics yeah. is literally the four of them. Yeah. Look at Beyonce's put a ring on it. Right. Fucking a 16. dozen people. Yeah. <laughs> like what the fuck man? Yeah, but it's, everything's so crammed into again talking about the industry. It's like yeah. we know this sells. Yeah, they find the formula. So. I mean, they found the formula, and so our job is to kind of like there's a mix bend, like a mix issue, I think, between audiences and artists. And I think now it's a little easier to get past that line that was drawn by other people. And that's what I like about you know the grassroots of the internet. Yeah, is I can put a fucking podcast yeah, out and here. It's there it forever, is, and you can monetize it, and yeah. they can't stop you from. Well, they NBC can. can't breathe down my fucking neck. Right. Like, <laughs> and if they do, you're having a great problem. Yeah, <laughs> that means there's a contract with right. several zeros in it. Yeah, zero zeros <laughs> that were my, where I'll say everything you said was right. <laughs> NBC, if you want to pay for it, I'll fucking I'll work with you. <laughs> Anybody. What was um, that? Did we even talk about bomb staging? I don't remember, did we? So, 
I've missed that question a couple times because I think it's a weird start to ah, the bomb you, podcast. So yeah, let's go ahead and 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 do that one. Well, it was weird. Like uh, one I mentioned too is because I I try to think like I know I've bombed, but I think I handle it in different ways where. Like if it happens, I'm like, okay, where did I go wrong and what I need to do? And then I try not to think about it again, because it's kind of one of the things I do like about comedy is it's in a very, inst- it's a very instant gratification type of art form. Yes. Both for us and for the performer. And it's also extremely subjective in a way that music isn't, you know, like you can, you can play certain chords and it'll make people somber. You can play certain beats and it'll make people feel peppy, mm-hmm. but humor mm, that's based on experience, you know, like yeah. that's based on a person's experience and you don't know what the audience's experience is. And so there've been many times where I think there have been like issues where the audience is not gelled with me. Um, and then there's been audience, there's been times where I've just fucking, you know, I'll miss a, miss a line and that throws off fuck, I hate the that. whole thing. Yeah. Cause that's one of the one things, word could fuck up everything. Yeah. And that's what, and I'm really working on a lot of that where it's like, okay, I know my bit really well. Um, so I don't need to study the bit anymore. I need to know it as a umbrella. So yeah. that way I can play with the audience a little more and feel more authentic. Cause the hardest thing, especially for me in doing the, the comedy and the writing side is, I don't really ever consider myself an actor, even if I have a character or play one. I'm mm-hmm. just not, I don't consider myself that. But I know that I have to act. And I also know that I have to present this as though I'm not. You know, like most people think that comedians are are riffing most of the time. And they're not. <laughs> Those <laughs> crazy, crazy fools. Right, yeah. You knew how much fucking prep that oh, shit comes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Even uh, Robin Williams. Yeah, absolutely. Um as much as that looked like it was off the top of his head was his rehearsals was like, okay, I'm going to go into my golf bits and I'm going to go to my Shakespeare. But yeah. like, I was, like he was still doing it. And not to say that there wasn't ad lib and there's definitely right. ad lib. Well, that's where that, I learned but, that from was because of him, because uh-huh. one of the things that many people brought up and was that he, he had his bits, but he left it open for him to play with the audience once they knew him and, and as everybody knows, like once you're a personality and people know you, they're a lot more forgiving and understanding yeah. of where you're coming from. And it's like one of the things I talk about with people with the blue comedy, you can't do really blue comedy in two to three minutes Mm-mm. because you have to give people a chance who when, not when they don't know you, Yeah, you have to give people a chance to find you likable before you start saying anything that's extremely, <laughs> it goes hard in the pain. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so it's an art form, you know, in yeah. that way. And I, I really like that. And that was one of the things I liked about what Robin Williams said was, you know, have your, everybody's saying, you know, you have your bits that you know, and then give yourself the freedom to segue. Cause then you might, it might reference in a different way. And then, so that way it is least not so repetitive for the audience. And it sucks now with the internet because unlike a song, people aren't going to listen to the same bit over and over again and yeah. send it back to you. The song they can listen to, all night on repeat and it For moves them decades. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh. I was pulling up and total eclipse of the heart was playing my absolute <laughs> favorite song. I was blasting <laughs> that shit out, bro. Turn around every now and then I fall apart. <laughs> yeah, bro. Fucking jams, bro. They got timpanis, a cannon. They got cannon, son. <laughs> this shit was black metal before it was black metal, bro. Bro. <laughs> um, one of the things that stuck out when you were, you were talking about was comedy versus music. Yeah. There's, such a, a mathematical science to music where like, okay, if I play this chord because you have, I, I'm pulling these out of my ass. Like right. you have this a com- competing against the C you have notes that are, they just like, they chime well on everything right. where with me, the, with comedy, you don't have that. There's no scientific, like, Oh, I've mentioned farts. So right. politics makes sense. Like, yeah. And there's, there's formulas and there's, like psychological tricks that you can play, but it's still very subjective, right? Like, yeah, I mean, there's joke structures, but right. like, just like, because I hit this structure you know, doesn't mean that joke. There's no be. strumming, right. like, yeah, it's yeah. it's fucking nuts, like that. Yeah, you I know? mean, like, there'll be there have been times like when I've done the hopeless thing, where I'll just fucking crush it, right? And I'll do the same thing, and the audience is just like, "What the fuck is happening here?" <laughs> You know, and and like I said, it's it's not for me. It's not that I never bomb. It's that I just try not to dwell on it. It's like, okay, where did I fuck up? Let me go. When did you start your comedy aspirations? What age? This is actually the the 
I've only probably started taking it serious a few months ago. Honestly. So that's the thing is, I mean, you're you're old enough to know that your existence doesn't, you know, hang on a good set and everything too. Right. So you well, have that, the mental maturity, yeah, they've, the emotional they've maturity. said a lot of that. Like the, the rare breeds of the Eddie Murphy's and the, you know, come out at 19, there's this weird level of insight and connection they have with the crowd that a lot of other people don't. Yeah. And it's the same thing with Chappelle. Like there are going to be those people that are both skilled and talented. And, um, I know that I do have, some talent and some skill. I know I don't suck. So it does, this means I have to work on it right on certain things. And, mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think that helps me too, is coming from the musical world. I mean, I've played hundreds and hundreds of shows, so I have a lot of stage time. Now it's different because I don't have the guitar in front of me and I don't have the, the, the other psychological tools for music to, to pull on the audience. Mm -hmm. But I also don't have the same level of discomfort because I've been places where people didn't get what I do, Yeah, you know, over and over again. And it's just like you learn to accept it because I think a, a hard part for a lot of entertainers in general is accepting that if you practice and you dedicate your life to your skill and, and you're competent, there is an audience for you. You're going to have to work harder to find it than others. Yeah. You know, but it, but as long as you straight don't suck and you try, you can find an audience that'll appreciate what you do, especially I think now when people are craving live entertainment again, Yeah, you know, and it's going to be this trick. And it was funny because my wife and I were bringing this up too. It's like, there's going to be this trick in play because everybody's been inundated with binge watching and electronic things with editing that goes at one to three Where it's seconds. Perfection, like, yeah, and yeah. it's all like da 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 da. And so it's all quick, it's all fast, and it, it, it chimes right into where their attention span is. But in a live setting, especially for comedy, that's not the way because you have to listen to someone talk. Yeah. And that is not what's been going on <laughs> <laughs> for the past however long with this. Uh, yeah, that is a concern for like bombs and everything mm -hmm. is yeah, we've all been binging Netflix for forever. Right. Um, and that's condensed. Yeah, I think there's multiple writers, multiple writing rooms and everything that have just made that absolute perfection where, like, I'm hoping that they're, at some point, COVID adds people to open mics where they're, right. like, they are starving yeah. for that. Yeah, I mean, um, there have been some really good mics starting to happen, which... Dude, three happy. E's, um, Louisa, um, yeah. dude, she put that on her uh, her feed on Facebook. I was yeah. like, holy shit, three E's is bumping like a yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, for an open mic, dude. I yeah. Mean, and that was it. That, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that all of them get back to that position. Yeah. And it becomes another because there's, I think there's more than enough for the, for more than enough room both for loonies and three E's and all the open mics. Yeah. With, well, I'm hoping we have a healthy competition between loonies and three. I never went into loonies, but like it just seems that people consider it like an old, tired, um, you know, comedy club. Yeah, yeah. Where like if three E's is stepping up their game, hopefully loonies stepping up, and then we get kind of like this arms well, race in yeah. Colorado Springs. Yeah, I mean, it's only going to be good <laughs> for uh, for everybody involved who's in that industry. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that loonies is that tried and true place. It's been here forever. People know it. You know, when you're going in there, you're seeing comedy and only comedy. Yeah. You know, and I continue. I, I hope that works with all of them and can and seeing the crowd start to grow is such a good feeling. Fuck. You know, yes. and they're ready to laugh. You know, and there's something different between an open mic at a bar and an open mic at a comedy club. Everybody that went to three E's knows they're going there for comedy. It's not the side dish with your fucking fries. Same thing. Isn't that the fucking worst? Right. Going to an open mic that's like at a place that's not a comedy club. Yeah. And people are just like, I, I one of my last times over at uh, Battle Mountain, yeah, yeah. there's somebody that having like a business meeting in the right. back corner. So you're trying to do your jokes. And there's like, yeah, like really fucking loud. I really like those quarterlies, Todd. And you're like, I'm <laughs> talking about jerking off with shampoo right. and you're back there trying to get the quarterlies. Fucking right. yeah, <laughs> at eight, eight, nine o'clock at night on a fucking Tuesday. What are you doing? Go home. Go home. Needless to say, I bombed that. So. Right. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I mean, I think those are the, when it comes to the bombs, I think a lot of it is going to be how people take it. I know there was, was one of the questions you sent was like, what would be the worst one? 
That yeah, one uh, one of the questions, the newer questions, yeah. was what is your biggest fear of the future? What no. uh, the example I had was shitting my pants on stage, <laughs> or the um, because a lot of my stuff's autobiographical, right, right. Um, bombing so bad that people just immediately pounce on like, wow, you suck at life, yeah, yeah. Um, and like because some of my stuff I'm wanting to go into my decisions as a younger person, mm -hmm. like I made some really tough decisions that I constantly battle with day to day. Yeah. But if I bring those up in comedy right. and then somebody's like, Oh, you're a shitty person. And right. then basically knocking the, uh, you know, the load bearing wall in my soul. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's the, the, the best part is when you know that you were a shitty person then when you did it. And that's yeah. the reason why you can talk about it now is, and the reality is, is the person who's pretending that they're not is full of shit. So fuck them. You know, like I've never met the perfect person. And that was one of the, I don't have that strong of self-esteem. <laughs> well, it, it, you'll, get there. <laughs> you'll get there. Like I, all, all of us do in one way or another, if we find our solid ground, like our foundation of the family and friends that love us and know us and, and treasure us for who we are. Yeah. Cause they all allow you to make those mistakes and they give you the grace that the strangers that are judging you, but the, my biggest fear you. though is that they cut through all that yeah and like just have like that oh fuck this i'm never doing comedy again yeah, like yeah, yeah. that's my biggest fear my, my <laughs> thing was just like you're gonna die do what you love as yeah. as much as you can w responsibly like uh, you know um and again for you brought it up and it was a really good point that i never even think about it. i forget that i'm older than a lot of these dudes just because yeah. i'm still into like, kid kid shit you know? <laughs> but i'm just in a very uh ron white's still making money off this shit so. <laughs> yeah right. well that's that's one thing too and and but because of that it's like i lived and tested a lot of things that other people haven't and it doesn't mean that i'm all all so much more experienced but i've also that time just gives me the opportunity to go through things it almost makes you bomb proof in your younger comedy years yeah you know where there's so many people oh uh some of the young guys coming out of high school right where they don't know what they're doing with their life. Right. So they're like, oh, fuck, if I bomb this, I'm bombing yeah, everything. Over. Like, and that's that's been it, too. Like, I mean, I've built a lot of stuff up, and I've had a good team of people that have assisted me to to be able to succeed in doing a lot of the things. Like, I haven't done any of it all by myself. It's all been because other people believed in me or believed in a certain project. And then I had – it doesn't mean I had didn't have to come out of the fucking pocket or make smart decisions – but it means that I've had people there that have allowed me to get to a position where you can't tell me what kind of music to write. <laughs> yeah. You can't tell me if I can record it or not. And I don't have to listen to your fucking producer. And you can't tell me what, like, unless it's your club, I don't care if you don't like what I'm doing. When they tell me not to come, I'll stop coming. Yeah. And that's, and that's just kind of where it's been. So for, for me, I, I hope, and that was what I started my company for was, for other artists to set themselves up in such a way where they don't need other people. Yeah. And I think now more than ever, ironically is probably when they're going to need my services the most, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's good because, because we're in this position where now it's affordable. Whereas when I was growing up, it was not affordable. Yeah. Matt, you was telling me this setup here would have been a hundred thousand dollars. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, like my first camera that doesn't record as good as a cell phone was six grand. Fuck. Yeah. Shit. So when you think about things like that and you, you find the people that are dedicated to the art form and, and, you know, that was the reason why I'd started my company in the first place was there are going to be those people that just have the calling to do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. Those are the people you invest your time and resources and energy in because they're going to do it whether they make a thousand dollars or they make a million dollars. And then you kind of have to decipher whether or not they have the work ethic yeah. to do it. And then that's where you start to see it. And then, but because other people can do this now. It's like, okay, well, you need to learn the contract side of it. You need to learn the legal side of it. You need to learn that. And I know those things. So my help is like, hey, I did it wrong for 10 years. You don't, you know, skip that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me help you skip that, you know, and then you can fuck those guys. Speaking of the work ethic, this is the only thing I've consistently in my life been like, I am going to chase comedy. Yeah. And I'm proud of how many like weeks I've actually done like the podcast and everything. Like when it comes to my regular job, I feel like I'm on a leash, like yeah. just pulling the entire time. Like I need to do comedy. Fuck this. Fuck this. Right. I just can't wait to retire and just get left, you know, taken off that leash and 
<laughs> yeah, and you can do your thing. And, and the, but the interesting thing, too, is that you're actually thinking about it in an intellectual way that's going to open doors for you in a way that other people can't. Because the reality is the days of you just sleeping on your friends' couches and touring all over the world and getting discovered, that's done. Yeah. Like you can still tour the all over and sleep on your friends' couches, but you better be creating some content with longevity because other people are doing that. And that's the thing content. with the comedy game is, you know, look at George Carlin, look at Gallagher. Yeah. They just, they continuously grinded, yeah. but the market was different. Yeah, absolutely. Was with, with George Carlin now, if he were, they'd be like, oh, cool, you do stand up, but like, if I'm going to continuously like, follow, subscribe, all this stuff, I need more content from you. Yeah. And I think that's where Bill Burr, Rogan, Tom Scarrell, these guys is like, okay, it's almost like your stand up is advertising the the greater experience of like Bill Burr or Joe Rogan. Is like, yeah, they become they've reached that kind of demigod status. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, for real, like because they're a personality, people know them and go into their. Yeah. And it doesn't mean they didn't work hard for it. They worked very hard to get to that point. But it's different because since they worked very hard to get to that point at a time when no one else was doing it, they set the formula and now everybody else is trying to find the formula and can find it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so the competition is way harder. Yeah. And, and you're going to figure out who's really the hobbyist and who's the careerist. Yeah. And, and it's okay like to have the professional hobby. Like there are some people um, that I've known – that I've had these conversations with, like, are you doing this because you want to pay your mortgage? Are you doing this so you can pay for your vacation with your family? Yeah. Are you doing this because this is what you're going to do every single day? Are you doing this because every once in a while you want to go out, have a good time and just get a laugh? Yeah. You know, and, and there, and there's room for all of that. You know, like one of the reasons I quit comedy for a long time was because uh, I was shooting this documentary and nobody would really talk to me who was a comedian. They would always try their bits on me. But once I started getting on stage, hold on, isn't that the worst? I fucking hate this. Is just be authentic you, with me. You're bro. being a good person, like listening to them, and at w some point it clicks over. Like this is a fucking bit, right. and it's cool <laughs> if you want to. And we talk about that, right? Like if you, because there's sometimes where you'll have a conversation with someone, and then it becomes a bit later for them because yeah, it's another thing you can, and you can tell, especially if you do it. When someone's working it on you, and you're just like, motherfucker, come on, bro. I, was just, hey. I had to have it at Dangerfields. Yeah. I was in the back, <laughs> and I was just being a good... I, yeah. My parents raised me. If somebody's talking to you, acknowledge them, like, you know, engage. It took me about 30 seconds. Like, this motherfucker's working a bit. Right. And he was doing it with everybody. Yeah. And he got up on stage. Like, that pretentious... I literally told my wife, I was like, hey, this pretentious douche that's about to get on stage, I want to record him to see, all right, if he's polishing in the fucking bar area right. with the comics, how good is this shit up on stage? It right. fucking sucks. <laughs> so, right. it felt good having that, though. Yeah. <laughs> but you could see, uh, so, you're saying you're doing your documentary? They're, um, oh, yeah. So, they wouldn't talk to me, and then they started to talk to me once I started doing it. And then that went for a long time. And then I, I was just enjoying it, getting time to hang out with some people I met. Like, turns out, like, one of my middle school friends, she started doing comedy and she drove down and I just bumped into her. And it was like, oh my God, we're both fucking nerds doing this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so there were a bunch of cool opportunities. But then it hit me. There were some people there that they were really, this was their career. Like they were focused on this. They were making money from this and they were trying to make money. And I was out there just having a good time. And when the open mics got to a point where people were starting to lose spots, that's when I was like, well, I don't need to be doing this because I'm a musician and this, they really need that. Like this is for them to do their craft. I'm not yeah. doing that. I'm filming and I'm, you know, and I use that to boost my business by filming sets. And I was always on the production side of it. Mm-hmm. And so then I just didn't perform for a very long time and outside of the Jason, the Kruger stuff, which gave me that the cool part about that project is it gave me the fun of the comedy side and the music side. So I got to do both. Okay. And I wasn't taking away from open mics or anything. Nice. And then when I got here, it was like, man, I really, I want to film a lot of people. I'm trying to find the right people that want to do the work, create the sketches, create all the stuff. And there's a lot of work behind it, but in doing that, Again, being in the entertainment industry, it's a lot of people have preconceptions about how much work it actually takes to put together a sketch. 
and to film it and to edit it and how many takes it is and how long it takes to get the sound and how long, all of the things that come with it. And so I have to find the right people that get that so we can do things like that. And at the same time, like understand that some people will be super talented, but that's not their role. Like maybe they're a great writer, but they're not a great performer. Yeah. Maybe they're a great performer. Maybe they're a shit writer. And I think in, in the past doing that here is what allowed me to go through that. And then I realized, like, well, I want to do this too, because I was getting up and just testing ideas for sketches. Mm -hmm. Cause my thought was if I can make you laugh at it, just telling you just the monologue, of then it. I can make you laugh showing, you, Yeah, you know? And, um, then when threes came, they were asking like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I really want to work on sketches and stuff. You're in the room and they asked that too. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And then I realized afterwards thinking about it, it's like, well, that's not helpful to the club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, They're real. fishing. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, I'm going here to take advantage of this opportunity that this other business owner is doing. So then I need to, I need to try to hone my craft for that as well. Yeah. And again, like I said, I don't suck. I have work to do in areas um, and I'll have good nights and then I'll have shit nights but I know that there's a responsibility I have to these other people that are taking that risk as well. Yeah. Cause they're opening up in a time whenever most people aren't and letting you try. Yeah. You know, and, and they're only making money off that, the bar and the food sales. So my response, and, and that I guess goes with the bombing too. It's like a while back. Cause I was in a prog band for a long time and it was all about like how awesome we could be. And then I realized as soon as I stopped looking at it, how awesome can we be and started looking like, what can I do to make them forget about their shitty day mm -hmm. and put my responsibility onto them? Cause they're taking their time out of their life. Then I started doing a lot better. Okay. Yeah. You know? And that's what I try to do. Taking that to the comedy thing. Like the, I had a good show a couple, uh, weeks ago and it just fucking was lightning in the bottle. It's like, oh, fucking, I'm glad I filmed it. It was awesome. I had another one and it was still funny, but it wasn't funny to me because I knew how funny the last one was. Okay. <laughs> and I allow myself to get fucked over and thrown out of the game because some asshole open noob showed up and just made a stink and started shit behind stage. And it, you know, like I was backstage getting ready and it now that influenced and played a part. But at the end of the night, I was like, that's still my fault. Yeah. I still, I shouldn't have rushed through this bit. I shouldn't have forgot this word. That's still my fault. Fuck you, guy. <laughs> you know, and if you're out there, you probably know who you are. And if not, I'm going to find your name. And the world, the uh, the world of people I know will know what a douchebag move you did. My 32 subscribers are going to do a deep dive. Fuck and they're yeah, going to find you. <laughs> we're not going to go after you. But we're going to hate you with a seething rage inside. <laughs> I like it. Um, one of the documentaries, I think Seinfeld, it's uh, the comedian or some shit. Mm -hmm. um, they were tracking. Uh, this is when Seinfeld was doing his. Um, I'm never gonna do these uh, jokes ever again. Right. That era. Yeah. Um, so they're watching a, a the master mm -hmm. start over again, but they're also watching um, this guy. He wasn't completely brand new, mm -hmm. but like he was struggling. He eventually met um, Seinfeld um, at, I think it was, um, was at the Montreal, uh, not the film festival, the uh, Just for Laughs. Okay. Um, and for the thing with Just for Laughs is it's a festival for comedy, I think for a week. But you go to this festival and there's comedians performing like 10 o'clock in the morning. Like yeah. it's just fucking literally like uh, 9 o'clock in the morning starts and then runs till like midnight or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he meets Seinfeld, and Seinfeld's talking shop with him. He's like, man, I had a really bad set. And he's like, oh, why is that? And he's like, well, it's, it's it's light outside. Nobody laughs during the set. He's like, that's that's on you as a comedian, yeah. you know? And, yeah, there's, as a young comedian, there's times like, man, that crowd sucks. And it's like, no, that I should have had that tool set. And eventually, I will have those tool sets if yeah. COVID ever lets me fucking do it. <laughs> um but I, I I can't wait to have that maturity of like, okay, this is a bad room, but right. I'm gonna turn this fucker around. Yeah. And you know? and when you know your material like that and you and you've found the confidence in yourself that you know you're likable, then you you can do it. Debatable you know? if I'm like right. well, <laughs> well yeah, but but we all we all kind of find that that way, right? Yeah. And one of the things that was awesome here is at Zodiac they had a, a open mic. And they do the all acts open mic. And one of my favorite things was um, they were all getting ready. It was like 15 comics and a bunch of kids came in 
and they were just fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, all these, and this was the thing about your bits. Like it made me realize, okay, well I need to work on more clean stuff. And I, and my stuff. Oh, so we're like, talking like elementary school. Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Cause oh. it was like a party. It was like a birthday party what that went a little late. Asshole, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it was a bunch. But the, the thing was, it made me realize, okay, this is the material that can go whenever this is the material for the bar. This is the word I'm going to use to swap out my swear words. And what I found too, is a lot of people rely on, um, obscenity to obfuscate the lack of creativity yeah and and sometimes you can use it as a power word and that's helpful but you can also tell when people are just it's a part of the their natural speech patterns part of how they speak and they don't know how to deal with it whenever a child's there (laughs) and so either your bit's funny because it's hilarious all the time or you're going to have to understand that situational comedy, but like you yeah. have to learn that as the artist. And it made me like, I went home and I just started writing a whole bunch of just like hokey, not bad, but still funny. Like there's some stuff that's just cause it's clean. Doesn't mean it's not funny. Yeah. You know? And I think that's a hard part for people to realize too, especially um, the comics that think a little deeper, mm-hmm. you know, because they want to find, they want to get to what they consider the truth. Yeah. And that's the goal. And then they bombed doing it for eight years. <laughs> One of the things I've heard from multiple people is it's easy to dirty up a clean act. It's really hard to clean up a dirty act. Yeah, that's facts, bro. Yeah. We did one, uh, like we showed up to a show once. We were playing for um, Fright Trail, which is this awesome haunted house. It's like 20 acres of haunted woods. Jesus Christ. And so we got to play before the audience. You said Fright Trail? Yeah, Fright Trail. Check it out. It's, it's super cool. And Louisiana. Yeah. And uh yeah, so we got to play for this event and uh, but we got there and the guy was like, Hey man, uh like it's a bunch of kids, so keep it family friendly. And I was <laughs> like, like, what do you mean? It's like PG thirteen and I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> and so like I had a group what like uh with the guys was like, Hey man, it's PG thirteen, so every swear word is pineapple and like and so we announced it to, what the pineapple <laughs> right, exactly. what are you talking about and so it was a lot of that and the best part was is we announced that we were doing that as part of the stick for the show so like all the teenagers the young kids were like <sighs> and the parents were laughing and the little kids were none the wiser and it was just it made for a really good time and i realized like oh man we are woefully ill-prepared I don't know if I have the <laughs> mental flexibility. Like, how much time did you have between the prep and the execution? About twenty minutes. Oh yeah, I'd been. Fucked. But again, like these were do- these were people I played with for a decade. You know, like, and some my, like my best friend is in there since I was fourteen years old. So, like we, fucking we figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> I would have been real one. pineapple to that right. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, literally, you guys have been like, yeah, MD's not talking today. Right. Uh, we'll It'll just... be the silent one. <laughs> yeah. It'll be the silent mother pineapple. <laughs> I would have been fucked. Right. So fucked. Well, we have gone almost 25 minutes over on our window, but Sorry, it, it all related to the bomb. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a couple of those clips, that, uh, or a couple of parts of the conversation that we had. Yeah. I might just transfer that over to the damned. Yeah, just because that's, cool. that's really good damned uh, stuff right there. But yeah, um I appreciate it, bro. Run it how you need, man. It's all good. Uh I think I'm done with the questions. Yeah. yeah we get mouthy, okay. sorry. It's all good because that's gonna go right into the damn podcast. <laughs> so uh, which we're about to record. So Oh well there we go. Um cool. My fucking brain's done. Uh <laughs> that's good. Wake it up. Wake it up. Alrighty guys, that was the Bomb Podcast with Jonathan Joe Bear. Mm. Not your bear, Joe Bear. Not my bear. That's Joe Bear. Yo Bear. There Joe, we go. Not yo. Not yo. <laughs> Joe Bear. That's Joe Bear. Joe Bear. I'm gonna bomb people's names. I swear. Do it, bro. <laughs> Do it. All right. Well, dumb last names. <laughs> hey, I'm the king of dumbass crazy names. So, um, hope you guys enjoyed the uh, podcast. Yes. Uh, I'll see you next week. Uh, love you. Have a good week. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, that's right. Bye.